Hi, so I'm going to introduce you to how to write DSLs without resorting too much to macros. So in my experience, writing DSL is hard. The main thing, the main error I do all the time is uh, using macros. Macros too much, macros everywhere. Uh, at the first, uh, at the first things that stopping me from producing, I, uh, I tend to say, hey, I, I know I'm going to use a macros. And uh, it's going for macros like for regexes. Once you use them, you have two problems. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so my experience with writing DSLs are with, uh, typically with NLive, which is an HTML tem templating and uh, transformation library. Mustache, which is um, an HTTP routing uh, library. And uh, Parsi, which is not finished yet, which is a parser generator. And doing all this work, I, I spot some patterns that I'm going to, to try to, to make clear and convince you to, to follow the, this rules or at least share my experience. And uh, I, I will work, work through, through an example which is a regex DSL and there's a more full-fledged version available in GitHub. The, the, the version which I will work, work you through will, will be way, way easier to understand than the one which is on GitHub. Okay, let's go. So what's a, what's a DSL? In, the, in Clojure, we have uh, already some DSLs in, uh, in the language itself. It's uh, what uh, focus called mini languages. So we have destructuring, C comprehensions, sweat first, sweat last, uh, anonymous uh, function literals, uh, syntax root, friend first conditions, and many, many small uh, parts of the language where the usual evaluation rules don't apply. And outside of the language, we have also many libraries which try to develop a kind of DSL. We have Clojure Cube, Closure QL, which is a kind of SQL in Closure. Clot, which Clot and ECAP, which is uh, extracted from uh, Composure. So it's uh, the routing and the uh, HTML generation stuff from uh, Composure. Mature, which is for pattern matching. And uh, NLive and Mustache that I've already talked about. So first, we have to agree on what is a DSL. To me, a DSL is, uh, is something which is limited in scope. It's in no way a general purpose language, by definition. And uh, we really don't want to even have a Turing complete language because it will be too hard to maintain, too hard to implement. And we already have a Turing complete language, it's closure. So we just have to, to make things better for our domain specific needs but we don't have to, to implement anything which is already done in Clojure. And I'm only, I'm only going to talk about internal DSL, that is uh, DSL written in the host language, not uh, DSL which has their own syntax and their own pattern. So I think that the, the thing that we separate uh, DSLs from API are the, the fact that uh, an API become a DSL as soon as uh, this API this provide a succinct or short notation for, for domain specific things. It can be both logic or data. And uh, usually DSLs are declarative and uh, in, um, by being declarative, they help us to reduce incidental complexity. So really, a DSL for me, something is a DSL as soon as you have a succinct declarative uh, notation. That's all. Like I said, it's kind of a blurry line because uh, when does an API be become uh, becomes a 
a DSL is quite blurry. At some, at some, extreme, at some end of the continuum, we have just data schemas. To me, even a common data schema like uh, the ring, uh, the ring specification for for how to represent uh, requests and response in HTTP is kind of a DSL. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have uh, the big macro, which is doing all evil things, uh, which is perverse perverting all uh, rules of common evaluation and which is driving the users crazy because uh, it's, no, it's no more regular closure code. Like, like I said, um, I made uh, several iterations while I was working on, uh, on closure, on uh, in life. I even uh, wrote several tentative templating engine before, uh, before in life. And at some point, I was quite happy with NLive, and the users start, start to complain. They were surprised. And they complained because they wanted the selectors, which are kind of CSS selectors in closure notation, to be first class because they wanted to be able to compose, to reuse part of them, and so on. And it wasn't easy. And it wasn't easy because I was abusing macros. So, uh, I wrote, I wrote in a remove mod macro. At some point, I remove uh, one, one half of the of all the macro that, that were in the, the source code base. And the the API the, the API stay about the same. The guy behind the closure query, which uh, who are uh, Kotawak best known or maybe as uh, Michael Van den Meyer and uh, Lau Jensen had a similar st story with Closure QA. The, the user complained that uh, it was too hard to, to reuse parts of the SQL queries and so on. And they, and they have started a, a rewrite of their front end, but right now the, the rewrite is still an ongoing endeavor. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> so I think that at this, by this time you have spoiled the pattern. The pattern is that users don't want a DSL. <laughs> <laughs> what, the, what the only thing they want, say, have a, a way to effectively write the, their domain specific things in a short and succinct way, but they want to use all the usual pleasure stuff. So they want values, they don't want a language. They want domain specific values. So to me, the, the, reset, the recipe for, uh, for DSL success, or at least for not failing completely at DSL, <laughs> is to have at first some uh, nice values and data types a handful of uh, or strong functional core of API around these data types. And eventually, you can add uh, some macros at the end to, to make things better. But you first have to have uh, great foundations before putting macros on top of it. So we really want to limit the complexity, both for for users and also in implementation for for us the the, the maintainer of the API. So to, to limit complexity, the first step is to limit scope. Like I said before, you are not going to to re to reinvent or anything which already exists in closure. So you are not going to implement control flow or even introduce your own uh, ad hoc uh, lexical binding. You are going to have to piggyback on what closure provides. The other point of limiting complexity is to limit syntax, which is very close to saying goodbye to macros. So you, you have to use closures, you have to use existing data types, at their best. And really, if you are not happy 
happy with the with the result, you you can always add some macro later to make it less ugly. But at least you will have some uh, some core, some some strong core on which to to build your your macros. And if users are are impeached by your macros, they can always go go back to your functional core and help themselves. So since we are going to limit scope and, uh, and syntax, we really have to start easy, very simple. So no macro, I think the, that by the, I know you are understood that I am arguing against macros because uh, macros are often used in a way which, uh, which relates to premature optimization. And uh, macros give you too much hope for your for your own good. So we really start on the just with data and and a handful of questions. About data, the first thing to do is to take uh, the existing closure data types and try to map dom domain specific semantics on top of them. And when uh, when you run out of uh, closure data types then you will have to implement your own data types with uh, dev record or dev type. But uh, I want to warn you against uh, not, not giving domain specific semantics to lists and symbols, because first, as literals, lists and symbols are, are, not, uh, are not really idiomatic. Nobody likes to, to quote everything. And uh, it will avoid confusion also later on if you had uh, a macro layer on top of it. So stay away from the list and symbols and keep them to clearly convey to the user that as soon as they see a parent or a free symbol, they are going back into closure land, into regular closure land, closure territory. There's some macro <laughs> edits around here which are going to complain that they really want macro. But like I said, macros are a kind of a parameter optimization. Uh, I've seen several times doing the parameter optimization to macros. Uh, in NLive, there's a commit where I cut the, the number of macros by twice. The same commit, the same commit made make the selectors first class and also allow for a simple design which helped uh, me to, to implement better optimi optimization strategy using simple, simple caching and so on. And the net result is that I have removed half of the macro and I have something which is better and faster. And uh, Self, uh, Dynamo, and uh, the JVM has taught us that uh, dynamic, dynamic stuff can beat uh, static stuff. So there's really two leg legitimate use cases for macros. These uh, use cases are con control flow and binding. To work around the, the no macro limitation and still be able to implement your own control flow, you have to wrap unevaluated things into closures or delay well, in sense. And uh, to work around binding, it's, uh, it's more difficult. You have to decouple binding from the rest of your, of your DSL, from the functional core. So to, to decouple, the, the binding part, you will have to, to design a version of your DSL which not use binding but capturing, which is going not to tell uh, here it's an X and I want to locally bind the X to the what is matched here, but just to say here I want to, to keep this value for, la for later use. So, if you have uh, two versions of your D, of your D, of your DSLs, one we, which is capturing and one which is binding, you can easily create a function which is going to 
to return a specification of the of the binding uh, binding spec into uh, capturing spec, and in the same way you can easily extract all the binding forms for from the binding specification. So here is a hypothetical one match uh, macro, which uh, which would be used in a pat in a pattern matching uh, library. You see that the, the pattern was no, no. so uh, the pattern is written in the binding in the binding language because since we are going to if we want binding we can't work our own macro so it's always a macro which is going to take a binding form so pattern is the binding specification value is the is the value to match the pattern again, against, and body the thing to ex execute if the match succeeds. So capturing is the first function that I that I talked about. This is the function which is going to turn the binding pattern into a capturing pattern. So matcher will be a chunk of pressure code which will evaluate to to plain old values. And matcher will be passed to capture, which always which also is a plain old function. So it's here that we see the decoupling part between uh, capturing and binding. We have the on the right hand side of the winelet we have the poly functional functional Macroless part of the language, <coughs> and on, on the right part, the, the binding itself. So, somewhat we have managed to put the binding stuff out of the functional core. Well, now I'm going through the, the example, which is a, a DSL for regex. Regexes are already by themselves a, a DSL, but an internal, uh, excuse me an external DSL. So the, my requirement for this DSL is to be able to compile, uh, to compile it to the closure host regex, regexes, which are the, the Java regexes, the Java pattern objects. And uh, why it may not be obviously useful to write uh, regex DSL, it's, uh, it's an easy example because many people know how regex works and uh, many people also have suffered of not being able to, to compose the regex, uh, to, to reuse part of them and so on. So we have first to ask what are our Basic, basic building blocks. For Redex, to me, it's at least to have literals, to have sequences, alternatives, uh, car ranges, and the white card. By white card, I mean the dot character, any car. So, I assume that the first thing was to map all needs to existing closure data types. So, here, we need to map literals sequence, alternatives, carriages, repetition, and white card to, to, pro, to closure of types. For literals, it's easy. It's going to be string and characters. Sequences, well, sequences, there's lists of vectors, but I, I already said that I don't want to, to use it. So we are, we are left with, with simply vectors, alternatives, being not ordered are a good fit for for sets. Here for current for car character ranges, I'm somewhat uh, abusing map the, the maps <laughs> because I representing each uh, each range in the by an entry in the map, with the key being the being uh, the lower bound of the range and the value being the upper bound. At this point, we have run out of uh, 
have closure types. So we'll have to, to use all types, but we will we'll construct the, this type by using factory. So for repetitions, I use a factory named repeat, and for white card, it will be a simple bar, which is any. To evaluate to the language to Java pattern, we need a, a simple function, which is going to be regex. Regex take, takes a data structures, the specifications, and is going to, to compile it. So it's a two-step process. First, we take the, the value which represents our regex, and then we compile it to a pattern string, and then pass the pattern string to Java pattern compile to create an actual pattern object. Since we are mainly dispatching on, uh, on type, the, the most obvious thing to, to do to implement pattern is to define pattern as a, as a protocol function. Here we have regex notation, which, which is a protocol with, 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 excuse me, with just one, one function. But in the old source code, which is available on GitHub, the, the example is a bit more complex because I also introduced name groups in, uh, in, in uh, regex. And so there are, more, there are more protocol functions into this protocol. So here is the simple extension of, the, of this protocol to the basic closure data types. For string and character, it's easy. We simply quote them. For person vector, we, we ask for the, the resulting pattern of the subcomponents and join them together. It's about the same thing about sets except that sets <coughs> need to be interspaced with pipes and uh, wrapped into, into a group, into a group to, to, not, to not have a precedence problem. And, and then a person map are simply generating a, a good old uh, character range. There should have some, uh, some special character escaping, but uh, it was too long for this slide. So here, now we have already a work, we have already a working DSL. We can write, we can create our, our value in any contrived way we want, and we will be able to, to compile it. Here, I'm, re I'm reusing many of the things that uh, I'm simply defining the car range 0 to 9 ones, and then I, I'm re reusing it. This, you can do that uh, in, the, in the usual regexes, and you wouldn't have been able to do that if you have been not using your macros, no, not using, this, excuse me, not using values, it's because <coughs> Your, your DSL specifications are for the first class that you can pass them around in locals and compare them. So really, I can call regex and then inside the regex put everything together or uh, create the, like in the second example, create the, the pieces of my uh, regex, of my regex outside of the regex call uh, Anyway, it will work in all cases. I can even go as far as to try to write the same thing with using into and interpose and see it will still work. So now we well, well covered how to implement repetitions and uh, the wildcard. To implement repetition, like I said, we are going to need a new type. So I de define a new type, which is a repetition, and then its factory function, which is repeat. And, repeti and I extend repetition to the, rather, I extend the regex notation protocol to repetition, and uh, that's all. In, uh, in what, nine, nine lines, I have, I have, I have added repetition
application to the to the DSL. So you you may no, you may notice that uh, the DSL is pretty open. It's not closed. The the user can enable it. It can enrich it. And for any for any it's a special case, any is a uh, the sole of its kind. There's there's no other uh, one card which uh, abides by the same which abides by the same rules. So the since it's, it's a one shot, the best thing to do is to use Wi-Fi to create it and to write this uh, this obvious implementation of pattern, which is to return dot for the white card. So you now that we have our, our functional core and our data types, we can easily define helper function, and users can define helper function. They can help the, they can help themselves. For example, here I show how a user can implement a join operator, which is going to repeat a regex by interspacing another regex in the middle of it between each uh, repetition. This is something, something which cannot be done in, uh, in, red, in uh, actual uh, or PCR, PCRE regexes because it's an internal language which can be extended. Here, it's easy to extend and it's interesting to, to note that the resulting regex is only slightly shorter than the regex code. So we are getting some, some gains on, uh, on the brevity of uh, notation even on uh, such, uh, an, such uh, a small example as, uh, or, two exam or two example as a uh, regex DSL. But the, the rule truth about helper function is that helper functions are <coughs> kind of macros for your DSLs, but macros which are executed at one time because they are not closure macros, but just uh, macros of your DSL. And uh, if we continue this, uh, this comparison, you may notice that regex, the main function which evaluates a specification to an actual regex, is somewhat like evolve. The last thing to do is to is to close the loop, because if we want to if we want to be sure that we we will be able to pass regex around or regex specification around, we have to have a way to canonicalize them. So we have to make regex the function it important, such as if you call twice regex on an input it won't matter. It will allow you to to get to to canonicalize your inputs a bit in the same way that uh, when you call seek on a collection that you get on a function, maybe you you already have a seek, but uh, you don't know if you have a seek or a collection, so you are calling seek. Seek and seek is idem potent on sequence, so it has no problem. It, it helps you to be sure that you have valid inputs, and this is the same <coughs> the same rationale behind making a regex or the main function which evaluates your DSL to make it idem potent. So now quickly, how one can. Uh, Add static optimization once everything is working in a <coughs> full, in a fully uh, functional way with no macro. We can try to add some static optimization by spotting part of the specifications, which are statics. We have no free variable, no free symbols, and so on. The, the simple way to to do, to do this is to walk through your data type. And to and to search for for symbol, but you you'll have to recognize recognize your own function 
so as to be able to, to spot that, that you know EG repeat. Repeat is part of the DSL, so if, if repeat appears in a specification, you can optimize it because you know how it behaves. But you, you have to be sure that you are not going to, to confuse my repeat with the repeat of closure core, for example, or with the local, or if the user has aliased the as early as repeat. You want to recognize in all cases. So the rule is to never co compare symbols but compare bars. You have to resolve bars by checking that first that the bars is not scheduled by local, by local. And uh, when you get the result bar, you simply compare if it's the bar you expected, it's if it's a bar that you know about. That's all. And uh, then you can uh, go further on and uh, pre-compile uh, constant, fra constant fragments so as to not have to evaluate them each time. That's all. <laughs>